the title of my talk is Oceanographic Variability Across the Gulf of Maine, as measured by NATS, which is a lousy acronym if I do say so myself, but uh, for Gulf of Maine North Atlantic Time Series, and it rhymes with bats, and uh, that's about the only, and of course NATS are appropriate to uh, Maine. I have several co-authors, uh, the information I'm going to present today, David Drapeau, Bruce Bowler, Laura Lebelsic, and Martha White, Meredith White. Um, let's see if I can advance this. There we go. And there are lots of other acknowledgments. I'm not going to go through these all together, but we've had over 70 people who have helped us do the, uh, the NATS transects over time. That's about 155 crossings of the Gulf of Maine uh, since 1998. And uh, uh, over the 15 years, about 440 person days at sea. And we're actually headed out next week. Uh, Tom Huntington and George Aiken at USGS uh, have been helpful with uh, river flow data. Nick Bates from uh, Bermuda has been running our carbonate chemistry measurements. Then I have the port captains of the various ferries, uh, the staffs and crew of the ferries and the ships that we work from, and uh, there's a bit of a retrospective analysis here with data from Charlie Yench, Carl Boyd, Jim Bazzani, and the NOAA MARMAP database, and of course uh, NASA for funding. <coughs> So I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, previous presenters. I think I've got them all, and uh, uh, if not, uh, I apologize for that. But um, all of these speakers did a great job of introducing the, the problems uh, of ocean acidification. So good a job that I'm not actually going to go through all those particulars. Uh, if you want to learn more of, of the issues of OA, uh, I highly suggest you go back and listen to these talks. I'll, I'll just very briefly pass, pass through this, uh, the, the basics of the problem. And there are a couple of publications. I'm not going to read all this, but um, I put these up just as references for, these are publications where we've actually uh, uh, put information out about the NATS time series. Uh, and in particular, the one in red, <coughs> if you want, um, some of the, the some of the plots that I'm going to show today are actually from this uh, paper, except uh, it's worthy of note that uh, I, we've updated them. So the paper stopped at 2010, and uh, uh, the plots today are going to take us up through 2013. So we can look at uh, how some of the changes uh, have gone since that paper was published. <coughs> so this this figure uh, has not changed. This was in the original uh, paper. And by the way, I'm happy to share the PDF. Just send me an email. The email's on the cover, the, uh, the cover slide. Uh, and I'll send you a PDF of the, the papers. <coughs> so this is uh, mean temperature from three different uh, weather stations in and around the Penobscot estuary uh, over the last, over a century worth of data. There's a lot of co-variability, and laid on top of that is a mean trend, which translates to about an increase in temperature in this region of about 1.14 degrees per century. Uh, the other thing, <coughs> oh, so the, the NATS database that I'll be talking about started in 1998 and covers this region just uh, at the uh, far right of your screen. And you'll note that we've had some extreme warm temperatures. We've gone through some uh, uh, pretty amazing weather in this period, and uh, that's also seen when you look at the precipitation. Uh, these are the precip numbers in meters per year for the three different weather stations. And uh, uh, if there's NATS, uh, a time period, and I'm going to sort of uh, white out two of those, and we're just going to look at Gardner. And in that period, we had one of the driest year uh, in, a, in a century, and uh, we have the wettest year uh, in a century as well. <coughs> and uh, those are those, let's see. And you can see the range is quite significant. So if you look at the variance in the precipitation uh, over each decade, over the century, you can see that that variance has increased. So on the left-hand side I show uh, the standard deviation of the decadal annual mean precipitation 
and versus year, and for all three of these different uh, uh, weather stations. And you can see that the variability is going up. And this is what most people have said is going to be the consequence of climate change. More extreme weather, more droughts, uh, more floods. And four of the eight wettest years in a century have been since 2005. That's uh, an important statistic. So what is NATS? <coughs> um, it's a sampling that crosses between uh, Portland, Maine, and Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. We're looking at hydrography, all these various uh, uh, variables here, SST, surface salinity, uh, XBTs, uh, moving vessel profilers down to 100 meters, chemistry, nutrient chemistry here, biogeochemistry, and numbers in red are numbers we've added in the last uh, couple of years. They were just funded uh, for us to start measuring these. So the PLC is particular organic carbon, particular inorganic carbon, dissolved organic carbon, and dissolved inorganic carbon. And that BSI over here is biogenic silica. In biology, we look at chlorophyll A, pigments, C14 primary production, and calcification, phytoplankton enumeration. Uh, we look at coccolithophorids. We also have a flow cam, so we're looking at functional groups of phytoplankton. Uh, diatoms, dinoflagellates, uh, nanoflagellates, uh, and so forth. And this is funded by NASA, and so we have a, a, a strong optical uh, side of this. And we measure what are called inherent optical properties, and some of these terms are pretty technical, but it basically boils down to optical properties that uh, uh, can be measured. It's, uh, there's no change as a function of sun angle. So these are instruments that we deploy for looking at light scattering, uh, elastic backscattering, uh, acid labile backscattering, which is a scattering due to suspended calcium carbonate, which is probably of interest to the uh, OA crowd, volume scattering, how light is scattered in three dimensions, inelastic scattering, which is fluorescence, uh, which we look at chlorophyll, CDOM fluorescence, that's colored dissolved organic matter, uh, and now we're also looking at nitrate absorption down in the UV using an instrument called a SUNA. We look at apparent optical properties. We have radiometers that we set over the top of the bow, and we're looking at above water uh, upwelling radiance, sky radiance, downwelling irradiance. These are all things you need to know to understand the signal, the reflectance signal, which is going back out to space. And then we've added a, a seasonal slocum glider missions. Uh, which gives us the depth of uh, variability, um, and we're looking at temperature, salinity, CDOM fluorescence, chlorophyll fluorescence, and backscattering at 531 nanometers, which is strongly correlated to particulate organic carbon. And melding the glider data into NATS, uh, we, we've spent a bit of time trying to, to get this right, and uh, we obviously get depth res resolution with the glider, and down here in the lower panel E, that's a, a section of temperature going between Portland, Maine, and Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, just as an, as an example. Uh, the, the cruise track of the glider is shown here. Uh, we're crossing the Hague line there. We can get it almost over to the shelf, and then we have to turn around and bring it back. We don't want fishermen to pick it up. Um, and for variables like temperature, salinity, chlorophyll, fluorescence, all of these, uh, we're extracting the six hourly surface data. Every time the glider comes up to the surface uh, to call home, uh, we extract that data and that becomes part of our sea surface data record uh, that we're taking from ships. So we're, we're increasing uh, the surface data set as well as providing vertical resolution. Here's a, just a picture collage. Many of you have probably seen this before uh, of the, the old Scotia prints. We have a laboratory on the back of a flatbed truck. And uh, here are the radiometers on the bow, moving vessel profile on the stern. Here's uh, the radiometers on the bow again as the cars are going in. As everyone knows, the Scotia prints left town uh, in 2004. Uh, and then we started using a fishing vessel, the Ella and Sadie, which I don't recommend to anybody. Uh, and we took all the equipment out of the van, and we would 
steam across the Gulf of Maine on the nicest day possible, stay overnight in Yarmouth, and then come back. And we'd have our filter setups and note the earplugs. And this gentleman here is Bruce Baller, and uh, it was uh, pretty quiet, uh, pretty loud. And here are our radiometers on the bow. And then we've used the Argo main, <coughs> and we are uh, putting our box on the stern, and then the cat came to town, uh, and we were using that, and here we are packed in on the, in the stern, and there we are inside, and we have an incubator uh, where we keep samples uh, for the productivities until we can get home and uh, do the C-14 work back at the lab. And here we are blasting our way across the Gulf of Maine at 50 miles an hour. And those are our radiometers uh, on the CAT. And then since then, since the CAT left, we've been using uh, the research vessel Connecticut. Uh, as I mentioned, we're headed out next week. We go out of Gloucester, uh, and uh, we put the box on there and head out uh, to Yarmouth from there. So the transit between Portland and Yarmouth is roughly east-west. And there is an early bias in the data set to the period from late spring to early fall. Uh, we became year-round, effective 2006. And uh, to show the data that you're going to see today, um, I use these Hofmaler diagrams, in which uh, space or longitude uh, is on the x-axis, and time, or year, or month, whichever, uh, is is on the y-axis. And then there are dashed lines you'll see on these plots, which are for the summer solstice, just to mark uh, the summer solstice of each year. And then we use Krigging, a uh, statistical technique, to contour these Hofmuller, point, uh, Hofmuller plots. And you'll see, here's an example for temperature, for example. From 1998 up through 2013, there's a hiatus right here. This is a funding hiatus. Uh, we didn't receive funds. Uh, it was a little bit delayed, and so we couldn't go. Uh, and everywhere in the early phases here, these white bands are periods when uh, the ferry was not running. And then you can see here where we started going year-round. And one thing to note about this plot, um, the 2012 high temperatures that uh, were all quite the discussion at the RARGOM meeting. Uh, here's what they look like uh, within the Nats database, and indeed it was the warmest year on record out there. Uh, we also, because we're dropping XBTs, uh, uh, we can look at the temperature gradient, for example. And here's the temperature gradient, and that's in uh, degrees Celsius per meter, per meter. And uh, you can see in the summertime in the middle of Jordan Basin, early on, we were getting uh, vertical gradients of a tenth of a degree per meter. Uh, and then since then, and even in the summer, uh, we're not even up to, we're up to about 0 0.06 uh, degrees uh, Celsius per meter. So th there's, there has been a change in the physics. And you'll actually see this when I show some of the OA variables. <coughs> Salinity is another thing which uh, now, uh, it, hopefully, you can see on your screens this very, the very deep red here, which is uh, compared to early on in the Nats uh, time series. Um, uh, these are significantly higher salinities. And the other thing to point out here is this period from about uh, 2006 up to 2010 of very low salinities, salinities less than 30. And, uh, and this region right out here, which is where the eastern main coastal current crosses our transect, it's the extension of the eastern main coastal current. And this was carrying water down from the St. John River. Uh, and these were these wet years that I was talking about. And uh, uh, very easy to measure and uh, very significant impact. And then with this uh, deep mixing that we've been seeing, or, or the lower gradients in temperature, we're seeing uh, higher salinities than we've seen. <clears throat> so there are some mean trends that we can talk about. Uh, and to do this, I've, I'm actually invoking this historical data that go way back uh, into the 70s, uh, which were taken 
either from ferries like the Marine Evangeline ferry across the same line. Carl Boyden, and Charlie Inch, and Dave Finney were using that, uh, as well as the MarMap data that we could find within five kilometers of the ferry line, uh, which we extracted. And so the data go back to 77. And in beware, there's very large variability in temperature and salinity in the chlorophyll signals. Uh, the mean trends are small with low or no statistical significance. But the mean trends, um, SST has shown a small increase of uh, 0.018 degrees Celsius per year. That's not including the 2012 data, I should add. And that's the, uh, the standard error. Um, and vertical temperature gradient, the, there has, it's been, the mean is minus 5.3 times 10 to the minus 4 uh, degrees Celsius per meter, but it's not statistically significant. Uh, that's the change, that's not statistically different from zero. And the salinity has shown a very small decrease, uh, which is significant, in uh, 0.0087. And chlorophyll has, sh has shown a decrease, but it's not significantly different from zero. Uh, and that's, those are the units, micrograms per liter per year, and it's minus 0 0.015. So a little bit about nutrients. <clears throat> um, I'm starting with silicate because it's, uh, it, this, and this is on a log scale, this is in micromolar, and um, basically, yeah, uh, concentrations have gone up, but generally there hasn't been a huge change in silicate. Uh, and that's pretty much across, in, in the middle of Jordan Basin, there is a bit more silicate than there used to be, but in, compared to the nitrate and phosphate, which I'll show you in a second, uh, this really has shown uh, relatively little change. And you can see the drawdown in the summer months, that's these areas here. Uh, but nitrate, this is nitrate plus nitrite, and that's, it's 99% nitrate. Um, there was a big change here. And again, this is a log scale. And you see over on the eastern side of the Gulf of Maine, there's no change. Uh, so this is the Scotian shelf water, which I denote up here. And this, and, uh, but in Jordan Basin, which is right there, East extension of the eastern main coastal current and western main coastal current over here, there's been a profound change. Here's what phosphate looks like. And again, uh, pretty much no change over here. And uh, in the middle of the Gulf and on the western side, uh, we're seeing much more nutrients up in the surface. And, uh, uh, and again, this is on a log scale. <clears throat> So a couple more comments about some of the variables we measure before I get into the OA uh, uh, variability. Um, this, this variable here, AGP412, is uh, we make absorption measurements uh, across the visible spectrum. And this includes dissolved and particulate. That's the G and P, G for Gelb stuff, P for particulate, uh, at 412 nanometers, which uh, we put as uh, if thought of as detrital absorption, uh, detrital and dissolved uh, absorption. And you can see in the wet years here, actually even preceding, we had a, a bit of an uh, 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 increase here, but mainly in this period here, you can see that we were getting elevated values uh, well away uh, from the coast. And you can also see even in the, uh, on the eastern side, this is probably um, this is obviously Scotian shelf water, but it's probably coming ultimately from the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, with added amounts of colored dissolved organic matter. That's really what we're looking at here. Uh, so, so elevated values here that go well out uh, 60 to 100 kilometers uh, from the coast. And if you take the ratio of the amount of absorption, now we're going up to 440 in the blue, which is the primary wavelength of, for chlorophyll absorption, where the phytoplankton are, are making their living. Uh, and you compare that absorption 
to the phytoplankton absorption, which you'd expect given the chlorophyll that's there. So this is the total absorption versus that uh, divided by that from the phytoplankton. And that number here is on a log scale going from very low numbers here almost uh, up, to, well, up to 60. And in this region here during the wet years, you know, the, the absorption was actually being dominated by other materials besides phytoplankton. And uh, so uh, this is what gave rise to one of our hypotheses that perhaps when we looked at the decrease in production, and I don't want to give, give away the punchline, but that perhaps uh, we were sheltering the phytoplankton from the light they needed with all this color dissolved organic matter. And here's DOC, which we started measuring in 2004, uh, and these are run by George Aiken uh, out at, at, in Boulder, Colorado, in his lab. And you can see, again, these wet years in massive amounts, uh, and this is milligrams carbon per liter, massive amounts of uh, carbon that are coming out of the rivers uh, is this dissolved organic carbon. <coughs> and then primary productivity. And you'll note <coughs> um, what we published in the, the 2012 paper basically went up through 2010. And we saw the step decrease in primary productivity. This is a log scale. Uh, so we're going from values of a couple of hundred milligrams carbon per meter cube per day down to values of 10 and 20. Uh, so conservatively about a factor of five drop in productivity. Uh, even this area here, which this frontal boundary between the Jordan Basin and Scotian Shelf, which always showed up as a high in productivity, all but disappeared in that time period. And then since then, since we published that paper, we, we've gotten our first uh, inkling in the summer of 2013. Our, our November cruise is not in there. It's right back down again. But uh, that perhaps we are starting to, to eke up again uh, uh, here, but generally values have still been quite low since, uh, since that period. And it's hard for me, I'm, I'm not a fisheries biologist, but it's hard for me to, to fathom that such a drop in productivity would not have an impact on the higher trophic levels. Um, we also measure calcification. And so people interested in OA are always asking me, well, you know, when they see this decrease in calcification, it, it went from being very measurable, this is coccolithophore calcification, to basically unmeasurable in this period during the wet years, right across the Gulf. And now we're starting to see some elevated values again, uh, but it's not, certainly not back up to anything like we saw there. And everyone says, oh, that must be OA. And uh, the, I, we don't have enough data yet to say whether that's the case. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the OA-related observations. Uh, as I said, uh, we were funded to start doing these about two years ago. And uh, so we really don't have enough data to be looking at long, any sort of decadal change or anything like that. Uh, we're measuring discrete DIC and alkalinity on preserved samples, uh, and then we constrain the carbonate system and use CO2 cis to calculate PCO2 carbonate pH. And the, or the uh, saturation uh, for aragonite and calcite, which I'll describe in a second. And the only uh, uh, OA slide that I'm going to show uh, is, is uh, this two, another panel we'll race in in a moment. But essentially, uh, so CO2, man-made CO2 is coming into the ocean. Uh, and it's combining with water to make carbonic acid. And then uh, that dissociates into a proton and, and bicarbonate. And then that proton combines with carbonate to make another bicarbonate. In doing so, you have less carbonate. Uh, the pH goes down. And that's seen in places like uh, Station Aloha. Uh, at the HOTS station, here's the Mauna Loa curve, uh, started by Keeling way back in the 50s. And here is uh, uh, CO2 in the surface waters uh, at Station Aloha. And you note that the, the slope of these lines is identical. 
So it's, it, there's a lot of variability here, but it's going up along with the atmospheric. And then here's pH down here in green, and you can see the decrease in, in pH with a fair amount of variability over time uh, since they started measuring it in 1990. So let's look at some Hofmuller plots uh, for, for the Gulf of Maine of the Nats transect. And uh, this, is, this is DIC uh, and west longitude, and now we're going from February of 2012 up to, this goes through August. And essentially, you know, the, the, the Gulf is, we're seeing variability pretty much Gulf-wide, uh, and we're looking at seasonal, uh, seasonal variability through time, uh, and we see for DIC, uh, the highest values in the November-March time period in the winter months, uh, and then uh, drawdown in the summer. <clears throat> There's more drawdown uh, on the western side of the Gulf than there is, there is some on the eastern side of the Gulf. But you see we get down to values of uh, 1900 here uh, uh, on the western side, and then here's August of, of last year. So that's DIC. Here's uh, the corrected total alkalinity, and uh, in this case, we're seeing, I, I think we're seeing the impacts here of river input, uh, these low alkalinity values here, about 2100, uh, and then uh, compared to values in the central Gulf of Maine uh, in the winter that uh, get, or in the early winter, they get up to 2200. And here's carbonate, and uh, you see we get very low carbonate values here uh, in the winter, uh, down uh, a bit below 100 here, and this is a Krigging, this uh, white spot here is a Krigging artifact, uh, but you can see the data points here that gave, rose, that gave rise to those. Um, and uh, the, the highest carbonate values uh, are observed in the summer. Again, it's uh, pretty much Gulf-wide, uh, and uh, we're looking primarily at seasonal variability. Now the uh, omega, which, and I put in the, the, the omega, which is the saturation here, in this case for aragonite, uh, with the calcium concentration, the carbonate concentration divided by the dissociation constant for aragonite. And that, this range is here, this is about 1.4, these low values here in March, over here on the eastern side, and on the western side, value is about 1.8. And uh, these are tracking temperature, as you'll see uh, quite well in, in a minute. Uh, and then most elevated carbonate values here uh, are in the summer months. <coughs> Here's the omega for calcite. Obviously, calcite is less soluble, so there are higher values here, but it's pretty much the identical pattern. So Gulf-wide, uh, we're seeing these Gulf-wide changes through time. And here's PCO2, and the range here goes from uh, below what we consider ambient, the 395, or I guess we passed 400 now. Uh, we'll draw down in the summer, uh, and then we have uh, increases here, and a very high value that we observed off of Yarmouth uh, in August of this year. But, um, and there is some, some east-west variability here, uh, which we didn't see in some of the other Here's pH, and uh, uh, the highest pH that we're seeing is a bit over 8.1, uh, and lows of just below 8, or in this very high uh, CO2 uh, station, the PCO2 we measured over here, we're down in 7.9. So I put together a table which, at least for the two years that we've been out there, looking at the highs, lows, the means, uh, and in particular, I just want to draw your attention uh, to the maxes and minimums, minima, and uh, uh, so DIC, uh, we highs of uh, 2078 down to 1871, and the pH highs to lows. And, and it gives you an idea, at least we're not getting below the magic value of 1 here for calcite, nor for aragonite, but um, I would also uh, uh, suggest you look at, uh, uh, Joe Salisbury had a really neat paper in EOS uh, where he was commenting on this, uh, the magic 1.6 number 
ferragonite, uh, where shellfish uh, are, are really not able to net calcify. Uh, and so it's possible that decreases uh, certainly values, uh, not, they're not below one, but low values here, nonetheless, could still represent problems for, for organisms that are trying to calcify. Uh, and Joe and Doug Vandermark have some great data from the west side of the Gulf of Maine uh, that also shows uh, the variability. And now I'm going to take a little time to look at some of the, the variables associated, uh, or sorry, the OA variables and associated variation of uh, physics, for example, physical uh, aspects like here's salinity. So here's DIC. Um, and about half of the variance tracks with salinity, and about half of the variance tracks with temperature. Uh, and so uh, the warmer months, you're seeing uh, the drawdown. Um, and there are also differences in solubility associated with temperature. And, and these are cases where uh, teasing apart the, the impact of biology and physics, for example, is, is no, no easy feat. So, uh, surface density, uh, here is uh, sigma theta and DIC, and we can account with, by taking into consideration both temperature and salinity, we can account for about 86% of the variability in DIC. Um, and this one here, panel D, uh, which shows uh, the vertical temperature gradient, um, and note these, these numbers here, a positive gradient means that it's getting cooler with depth. And a negative gradient, there are times in the winter when we're out there when the water at depth is actually warmer than it is at the surface, like times like right now. And uh, so that's how you can get these negative values here. But essentially, the source of that DIC, I believe, uh, is in this deep water. So when there's a small gradient, uh, and there's high density, this water is making its way up to the surface from down deep, and when there's stratification, and uh, uh, such that there's reduced mixing, you get drawdown, and you'll see lower DIC uh, in these summer months here. How about uh, omega aragonite? So the saturation constant for aragonite, uh, and these actually track, uh, there's some of the variants we can, and this is significant by the way, we can uh, track two primary productivities. So these are our C14 primary productivities. Uh, it's only about a quarter of the variance, nonetheless, and it's on a log scale. Um, here is omega as a, a function of pH. <coughs> you might expect there to be uh, this positive relationship, but, uh, uh, and, and, surface density here, uh, the higher density water which is coming from down deeper has a lower omega aragonite, and so uh, this is deep water likely written, mixed up to the surface uh, and in the winter. And here is uh, nitrate and nitrite, and I'm not in, in any way invoking cause and effect here, but I'm just noting that the deep water which is rich in nitrate uh, is also uh, has low omegas associated with it. And then these are surface waters uh, where there's been drawdown of the nitrate from uh, primary production. And then the last uh, plot, plot uh, for omega here is uh, PCO2 uh, and omega. And uh, it's, it's not as clean as I expected. I thought it would be cleaner than that. Um, but essentially saying that when the PCO2s are high, the omegas are low. So within NATS, there is no statistically significant relationship between chlorophyll, i.e. phytoplankton standing stock, and other OA parameters like PCO2, DIC, omega aragonite, omega calcite, pH. And so I'm not going to uh, waste your time by showing you uh, plots of shotgun blasts. There is no relationship between chlorophyll and these variables. The only significant relationships uh, with the biology involve primary production, the rate measurement, not the chlorophyll, which is a standing stock. 
And, and this really brings to light the, the, these associations between physics, chemistry, and biology in the sea makes separating their effects on carbonate chemistry very difficult indeed. For example, uh, in, in a stratified ocean, um, the phytoplank, certain phytoplankton groups might find uh, those stratified environments more optimal for growth, therefore there's drawdown, but in those stratified oceans the temperature is also elevated and there, there's, there are physical uh, uh, reasons that you would expect changes in solubility, for example. Uh, and everyone knows since the work of, of Holligan and Pingree way back in the 70s that at frontal boundaries when you change the stratification you will in effect, uh, you can change the productivity and you can also change the temperature. So teasing apart the variance in the OA variables uh, as a function of physics and biology and, and the big surprise for me was how little chlorophyll had to do with it. Uh, in fact, chlorophyll and nitrate don't even correlate well, but primary productivity and nitrate do. Just some things to think about. So I'm going to end. Uh, uh, we, we, in the, the uh, 2012 paper, um, we looked at the annual means of the Penobscot River discharge uh, and how it affected uh, various properties gulf-wide. So we would go to the NATS database and we would calculate, say, the mean and the variance for salinity across the entire gulf for this one particular trip. Uh, or we, in this case, uh, we actually came up with mean, uh, annual means, and we did the annual means only uh, for the period when the ferry was running. So that was something that has never changed. We've always been out there uh, from late spring to early fall, and so we segregated the database so that we could look through the entire uh, NATS time series to look at gulf-wide change, uh, annual variability as it might relate to river discharge. And we use the Penobscot because it's, uh, it's so well, uh, uh, the, the flow rates are so well described, uh, and the database for flow rates goes back uh, over 100 years. And so discharge and precip and all the stuff I showed you in the very beginning, uh, we've got that in the Penobscot. And I'm assuming, and I think it's not unreasonable that uh, the river discharge, uh, at least in a climatology sense, the Penobscot is going to be representative of other rivers. It's the second biggest river in Maine, uh, the St. John being the biggest. And uh, we see both water along the Nats Transit. So long story short, uh, here's Penobscot River discharge and surface salinity, so you'd expect more river discharge. The salinities would go down, and these are salinity anomalies, and in fact, that's what you see. The variance uh, that one sees across the transect, the Nats transect, goes up in years of high river discharge. Again, that's uh, not a big surprise. Uh, surface densities go down in years of large discharge. And again, not a big surprise if you're lowering the salinity. But now here is uh, the surface absorption from detritus and colored dissolved organic matter, uh, which as you get higher discharge, you, the anomaly here, uh, this is a 0.1 per meter gulf wide uh, on average. And, and of course you see higher variability in that as well. Um, this is backscattering as a function of the particular organic carbon. And this goes up uh, as you have higher river discharge, although you could argue maybe it's flat, flat, and then we're seeing elevated values. But it's significant at the 0.05 alpha level. And lastly, silicate here, which was totally opposite to what we expected, uh, goes down in years of high river discharge. I don't have time to go into this. Uh, except I think this may be part and parcel of changing the inflow of deep water uh, coming in through the Northeast Channel and affecting Gulf-wide nutrient budgets. So the, what we're doing now, and this sort of takes us to the future, we're, we're measuring all the different aspects of the carbon cycle within NATS from dissolved particulate, inorganic, uh, and PCO2 and DIC. And we're interested in the transformations in these different carbon pools 
as a function of climate change. And we've been now synthesizing our glider data. Down here we have time, and uh, we integrate, we use optical proxies to integrate DOC, for example, uh, through the water column as measured by the glider, or POC uh, using the backscattering measurements. This is using CDOM fluorescence. Uh, and we have pretty good optical proxies for that. And you can look at the variability now over the water column, uh, and these are the sorts of sections. You can see the bottom nepheloid layer here, for example. You can see the sea dom coming off of the shore, uh, off of the western, uh, off of the east coast of Maine, and the sea dom uh, coming off. And so we're looking at about 10% variability here in DOC over this time period and we're looking at about a 20% change uh, in POC with this very high, these very high values in 2008. And lastly, our goal is a synthesis of carbon pools, and uh, here I show some glider data, some uh, uh, satellite data from the same period, and he, these are ship data for POC, uh, glider, satellite, and uh, ship. Uh, they're different color scales, I'm sorry about that, but there you can see the variability that they're seeing is all pretty much, uh, they're seeing the same variability, and our idea here is that we can then uh, look at long-term change over time in the area that we call the Gulf of Maine. So in summary, the Gulf is warming and freshening, uh, but the annual variability is large. The nutrients are not being drawn down as they were prior to the wet years. Primary productivity and calcification have not returned to the pre-2006 levels, but they've slightly increased. The OA parameters generally show Gulf-wide response, not varying greatly across the Gulf, uh, and more looking at seasonal change. And the low aragonite saturation levels in the winter, which, are, which get down to 1.4, actually, uh, and you see Joe's paper here. Uh, uh, I think are of interest as much of interest as, excuse me, the, the range that one sees. There's strong ties of DIC to physics mixing and biological drawdown. And the synthesis of Nat's glider deployment shows high, <coughs> excuse me, high consistency between missions, uh, eastward and westward transects of the glider. Vertically integrated DOC has changed about 10% in the Gulf since 2008 and POC has dropped about 20%. So the future are, is to define the accuracy of different carbon pools as measured by the glider, satellite, and ship. What are the error bars on the carbon pool estimates? And how are the Gulf of Maine carbon pools responding to climate change? And that's it. Thank you very much.